And I'm really honored. It's really my pleasure and my honor to be here and just sharing uh, some thoughts, some ideas just to add to the discussion. So thank you, thank you so much. And with the permission of Chair uh, Dr. Perman, thank you for your remarks. And Dr. Gordon, thank you for your remarks because that gives me the framework to what I'm gonna be talking in. Greetings, uh, our Dean Boris Luzniak, which great colleague and friend from our association. And I don't know if here in the room is also uh, Diane Marie San George. Hi. <laughs> we both share these great uh, colleagues in our two worlds. So that, that, that's wonderful. First of all, I, I want to really congratulate this, uh, this day, uh, exactly what, what you were saying. I think this is a topic that we are all struggling. They really, we all want to do something. We need to do something to stand out our institutions in, in really moving the needle. Uh, in this regard. So hopefully some of the reflections I'm going to be sharing and, and, and our, uh, really our, our colleagues are already talking a little bit about some of these, these challenges are going to help the conversations during, during the, the day. So I would like to actually touch about two particular angles because health equity, we can talk about it from very, very different angles. One, one angle is what do we mean when we talk about health? What is our approach to health? And I, I would like to a little bit uh, challenge a little bit the way we see health. And the second topic is, uh, is about anti-racism institutions because we, if we really want to move the needle, if we really want our students to be, change, uh, to be agents of change, we need to really stand up in this issue and we really need to become anti-racism institutions. So, so what, what does that mean from the curriculum, from the faculty, from the students, from the, from the environment? So I'm gonna be talking about those two things. So let's start with the first one. We always think uh, that we talk about health, right? And if we are, and, and, and I'm so happy to be here among our colleagues, we are all in the health professions, right? And we very often talk about health, but what we really mean when we talk about health, when we are in the dinner table with colleagues or our friends is, we always talk about medicines, we all talk about hospitals, we talk about uh, labs, and all of that is good, right? Because we need that. But all of that is health care, not necessarily talk about the whole continuum of health and well-being. So I think that there, there's something in our language, there's something in our minds that every time that we relate to health, we really mean health care. And the problem with that approach is that then all our energy, all our curriculum, all our resources, as you're going to see later, goes to that part of the, uh, of the equation, which is extremely important. But health and well-being, and as it relates to health equity, it really has to be included in a holistic way. What do we mean by health in the in the biggest sense of the of the of the word? So when we talk about or when we think about health, it's really the conditions, the places where we live, where we learn, where we work and play which affect our, our health and our outcomes, as, as you were referring, uh, Mr. Chancellor. All of that de depends on where, uh, the, if we are healthy or not. So it doesn't matter how much we do at the health care if we are not impacting the other issues that makes people uh, healthy uh, in the first place. And I know that we have talked about this, but my question to you is that how much of that is already in the curriculum? How ready our health professionals to be are learning about what to do and what to, to do with and, and actually working even uh, not just with all the health professionals but beyond the health professionals. So for example in the Gates uh, report about uh, in the Gates Foundation report about uh, inequalities they just put an example that we all know right Bill Gates said Oh, I, I mean, my whole life I have been, you know, fortunate enough to have a nice geography, demographics, uh, fragility in terms of my environment, socioeconomic, so I'm basically fine, right? Melinda Gates said, oh, well, I'm, as well, I, I had, you know, I, I didn't have any problems at all, except maybe gender could, could play, a, you know, a, a role when I was young, but it was fine. But if we think about a, a girl in Africa, Every single condition is going to be, uh, 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 you know, a mountain there. So if you think about the gender, if you think about race, if you think about age, if you think about climate, if you think about climate, I mean the conflict, uh, every single thing is going to be 
a burden there. So what can we expect of this person as compared to the others in terms of the health outcomes uh, of her? And if we just take two and, and, uh, two, uh, you know, uh, indicate health indicators, and, and again, my predecessors already talked about them, but let's talk about life expectancy. And I think that's something that we need to be really happy about is that in the last century, of course, we have double life expectancy around the world, around the world. But because we have not been, you know, uh, seeing health in terms of the health conditions, the disparities among the countries and within the countries are just growing. So, for example, the difference between uh, here, between uh, Europe or Oceania and, and Africa, is 20 years of life expectancy. Uh, so there are huge life uh, huge disparities among the, among the countries. Uh, for example, in Central Africa, it's 53 years compared to Hong Kong, 85 years. But the difference, as, as, we, have, as we know, is not just within the countries. Sometimes we, we tend to think that it's within the countries, I mean, uh, among the countries, but it's also within the countries. So we already know that the zip code really defines how many you know, uh, years uh, you're going you're gonna to live, but also your race. There are, this is in the United States. There are seven years difference between uh, white non-Hispanic and black non-Hispanic. Let's take another one, child mortality. So child mortality, again, great success in the whole world in terms of decreasing the number of deaths. But they, just look at the difference. The difference is still very high between, uh, like for example, in this graphic, Nigeria and, and, and China. So the chance of a child dying before age five in Angola is 90 times higher than in Finland. And again, ethnicity also plays a role here. So they not, it, that, that's here in, in the United States. So the non-Hispanic black, it's double uh, uh, the, the, the cases than, for example, the non-Hispanic whites. And at the beginning I said, this is the, the way we see uh, uh, health, or we define health, it depends a lot in how much energy and money we spend, of course, in the way we think health has to be. So, for example, this is an, uh, an example of how, how much money United States spends in health, as opposed to other countries that are similar to them. In this, in this graphic, you can see the example for like, uh, like Germany, Canada, France, Sweden, so, you know, very similar countries from the United States. And you can see that not only the United States is a country that, that spends the most in health in the whole world, and let me add, in health care around the world, but also, for example, just compared to the United Kingdom, it spends three times more than the United Kingdom in, in, you know, in terms of the, the, the budget that they finance uh, for, for, for health, for health care. Uh, and then you can imagine, well, if we spend so much money, then we'll, it's great outcomes, right? But the sad news is that not only we spend the most, but we are the country that have the, 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 the deepest uh, or the, the lowest uh, outcomes in health. The poorest outcomes of health compared to these other countries is the United States. So we spend a lot, you know, much, a lot, but we are not getting you know, the results that we want. So we should stop and, and think about it. But why? Is it about the money? If it's not about the money, because we, have, we spend all this money, why we are not having the outcomes of health that we're supposed to have? So all of this information is, is just about for us to think about what are we doing? Uh, or what are the other health perspectives that we need to take into consideration in order to really... Um, have better uh, health outcomes. And one, one of the hypotheses is that we spend a lot in medical care, around 90% of that budget, while the risk factors are actually in the social determinants, are in the health behaviors. So it's a clear mismatch. We're spending a lot in one thing that's very important, but we are not spending in the right things that actually would make us a, a healthier society. And even to put it in a worse scenario, we are not spending enough now in the social conditions. This is a graphic, again, comparing uh, the other countries, uh, comparable to the United States, where we can see the United States in the number 16, we, we are you know, spending the most in, in healthcare, 
and the orange, we are spending the least of all countries in that category in the social uh, conditions. So now you we can start understanding why these existing, we, are not, we have not been able really to correct the existing and growing social gaps. So one of the challenges is that health equity aims to ensure that all people have full and equal access to opportunities that enable them to lead healthy lives. What does that mean? That we're not just talking about health care, but we're talking about First of all, the whole life continuum and all the conditions. So what is our responsibility as health professionals in order to act in the social conditions? And one way, one way that at least I like to see it because I like soccer, <laughs> I like to see it is that we are, at least in the health professions and all the condi social conditions, we are a team. So I don't know if you like soccer, but please let me know who, who do you think is the most important player in the soccer team. <laughs> Who's, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. The striker. The striker. <laughs> Do you think the goalie is the most important uh, uh, player? The most important player? The goalie? What do you think? You think so? Who plays soccer here? Or who has been the uh, team? Do you, what's your answer there? Do you think that the goalie is the most important player? Okay, <laughs> the team approach, I think that the, 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 the keeper, the goalie keeper is such a, I mean, is a very important player, but he's, or he or she is there when everybody else fails, you know, to protect the ball from coming to here, right? What we want everyone is just to keep on going with the ball in the game without not going to the, to the, to the keeper, right? So. Think about all of us as being a player, a, a soccer player, right? So the goal, the keeper is actually the healthcare system. Is there just, if we fail, if we don't have, if we didn't do anything about exercising or healthy diets, the climate continues to, cha to change and be really bad to your health, you don't have a good education, transportation, if all of that fails, of course we want a great uh, uh, goalie keeper in order to keep us safe, right? But what about the others? They need to be doing their job in order to really not saturate you know, all, the, all, 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 the, all, the, all the goalkeepers, right? We need really, really all the players in order to really be, so the players are education and is the transportation and is your housing and is the climate, is all the conditions are the social conditions that we need to keep the ball in the ground, just playing and not really reaching uh, at the end of the, of the, you know, of the, of the game. So, let me stop here in terms of just, you know, trying to summarize this first thought that talks about if we all know, and I know that I'm preaching to the choir, we all know that the social conditions are such an important thing. But, but I think the challenge for today in your, in your working groups is that if we know that, then how much of our curriculum, our practices, how much, for example, interprofessional education are we doing in our, in our program in order to really make sure all our students know this, and they are really working with the others in order to prevent. And not just, I think there's a lot to do with the social, uh, I mean, um, with the health professions. We all need, I'm, I am in the, in the uh, uh, public health, and we need to do a lot more with all of you. But we also need to do a lot with the others that are not health professions, as, as we see. How much we work with transportation? or with the students that are, that are gonna be the lawyers or the engineers or the architects. So I think that there's a lot of interprofessional education that has to happen in our, all our systems. We need to do more of that. It, that's the only way that we can really start training more like teams of people as opposed to just uh, one silos of, the pro of, of professions, which actually we have a lot of that. How much of these people are bring, can we bring to the classroom as faculty, as you know, guests, and the practicum of our students? So all of that, I think there are very practical steps that we can do in order to really reconciliate more in our curriculum and our practices that we are, we are really tackling the social determinants of health more in our health professional curriculum. So that's more of like, and, I'm, and I will be more than looking forward to hear your thoughts about, about this. And the other 
angle that I would like to 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 just to talk a little bit, it's about advancing health equity, but through the anti-racist academic uh, institutions. So higher education institutions are, are failing to fully buy into an equitable and just society for all. Black and Latinos students are more likely to receive education from institutions that are less well-funded, have higher dropout rates, operate for profit, pay lower faculty salaries, and have higher students to faculty ratios. So the educational spending gap alone gives white students a five billion advantage over the students of color at public colleges every year. And spending directly, of course, we all know, impacts students' graduation rates. For those who do graduate, racial inequities follow them into the job market. A study in, in, in 2019 from Georgetown University found that white workers, as compared to black and Latino workers, are more likely to have good jobs and are paid more at every level of education. The study also found that white workers with good jobs earn 554 billion more annually than they would if good jobs and good jobs earnings were equitably distributed in the workforce. So as Dr. Krisny Metiver pointed out in her influential article, Envisioning Higher Education as Anti-Racist, American institutions have already ensured immense generational advantage for whites and disadvantage for people of color. This will continue if we do nothing. The time for all institutions to become anti-racist is long overdue. So being passive is not an option. So we have really go deeply into this issue in the ASPPH, in our association, and here our members uh, can speak to that. So the members, and, 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 but, but we are just an example. Other institutions are doing the same as well. So the members and staff of our association have pledged to accelerate our commitment to address racial injustice by teaching the skills to advocate for an essential public health values of compassion, empathy, justice, and equity. All of these are cross-cutting competencies that all of us can put in our curriculum. It's not, like, it's not a lecture, it's not, a, it's not another course. It's a cross-cutting theme that all the courses and everything that we do in the university should reflect these this, this, uh, um, tenures. So advancing research on the structures that shape health inequalities and applying that knowledge into practice is also one of our responsibilities. So in the association, we said that we will work with community partners to model the behaviors and values that we must demand of our national leaders and those who serve in law enforcement. So we will continue to support the recruitment and retention of a diverse group of faculty, students, and staff to achieve inclusive excellence. As an academic public health community, we recommit to our deeply held uh, tenets of public health, which are human rights, social justice, and health equity. So ASPPH will never be silent on racial justices and injustices. We will use our platform to advance our mission to improve health for everyone, everywhere. I think it's very important that the organizations and institutions really come forward with strong and bold statements in order for the whole community to really continue and, and, and support uh, your ideas. So the next part of my, my, my presentation are gonna be just examples uh, that institutions, organizations, and actually just the literature has come up with what are the specific things that we can do in order to really become an anti-racism uh, institution. So all of these are just examples. I'm gonna go to some of the examples that of course later on in your, in your, in your groups that you can talk about uh, if it, some of them may be more feasible, some of them are more <coughs> easy to do, others are maybe you don't agree, but let's just, as an example, because a lot of people, a lot of institutions are like, well, I, I get it, but then how can we move really the, 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 the needle? So for example, we need to do a lot of things, you know, uh, not just in the classroom, but in the institution. The first examples are actually from institutional policies, the whole institution. So the whole institution can 
take responsibility, for example, for your institution's historical participation in racism and discrimination, can develop funded mandatory anti-racism workshops, really groups, uh, teach-ins, denounce all racism, hate, discrimination, and bias, follow transparent procedures for removing faculty, staff, and students who perpetuate discrimination, hate, and or bias, implement a university-wide hate and bias incident reporting system, and, and, and others. Uh, create visible, well-funded, and continuing partnership with HBCUs, support graduate student workers and adjunct faculty unions, lower tuition fees, and create sibling scale tuition structures. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna choose uh, uh, you know, some ones. I mean, you, you have the whole presentation, so you can actually read later the others, but just, just to have an example. But for example, flight internal corruption and discriminatory hiring, fighting, and promoting practices, eliminate legacy and donor considerations in applications and, and others. What can, can we do in the student field experiences, for example, because I know that you're gonna have a, 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 a table, a, a round table about that. Well, we can fund trips for students to historical sites to learn the histories of racism and colonialism. We can build and fund student internships opportunities with organizations fighting against systemic racism. We can engage students in anti-racist activism, advocacy, very important. We can expose all students to situations in which they will interact with diverse populations. We can require students to participate in community-engaged research. Another example from faculty development and support. We can hire researchers and educators who do critical race, ethnic, uh, and, and gender studies work, increase tenure track faculty positions to 80% or, or, or higher. We can identify anti-racist intercultural and trauma-informed teaching competencies, engage community partners, we can mon monitor student mentoring and advising workloads for underrepresented faculty. In terms of courses and curricula, we can develop and assess competencies in inclusion, diversity, equity, and anti-racism. And again, I think that's something that I have seen is that most of the institutions are trying to put all these competencies in a cross-cutting way in the curriculum in order to really, it, this is a responsibility of all of us. It's not, a, it's not just an adding one course in DEI. No, that doesn't, well, sometimes it works, but, but, but I think that the, the most effective one is that we all have a responsibility and we need to show in the curriculum and in the syllabus, how are we gonna be doing this? Because this, this could be very like, it's a responsibility for everyone and then at the end is no one's responsibility. So it's just like, we need to show how are we gonna be doing these things in the, in the curriculum. We can recognize excellence in faculty teaching that addresses the impact of racism, establish or expand postdoctoral fellowship programs for underrepresented students and other. We can support local communities, support local black and brown owned businesses that maybe some of, for example, some of the practice that we have, we have uh, done lately in, in our own association is just really we are reviewing very carefully everything that we do in terms of all the, all the, all the business, all, you know, to engage with all the business and everything, starting from just catering and the printer and all of that in order to review if we are really supporting local black and brown uh, uh, owned businesses. We can build local food system infrastructure, affordable housing and, and doing more with the, with the communities. We do have, so you can actually see it online, uh, the whole report, which is dismantling racism and structural racism in academic public health, is public in our in our uh, in our webpage, and um, you can read the whole uh, framework there with these and other ideas as well. And I highly recommend uh, this uh, article from Inside Higher Education: Envision Higher Education as Anti-Racist Institutions for like more ideas. And I really want to end, because I really want to uh, have some conversation with you, to uh, this third part of the conversation, which what are the principles that enable really uh, the change? And there are four that at least I can, I, can, I can recommend. Number one is all reforms must be committed to reinstating civil rights, restorative justice, dignity, and respect to the communities that have been the targets of systemic racism. Number two, all reforms must be holistic, recognizing that racism is a perv pervasive system that holds a tight iron first on black, indigenous, 
and people of color communities. This recommendation should not be treated as a menu of options, but rather a cohesive and comprehensive approach. Number three, all reforms must be participatory. So that I, I love this, 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 this conference, this workshop, this, this event, because this is the way we, we don't, any of us have like, you know, what's the right answer? Who knows? We, we all have ideas, we can share what we are doing in our own communities, but it's about the community and we need to participate in, in terms of trying to, to decide what is, what, what is the best way that works for this particular moment, for this particular system. So all reforms must be participatory, enabling. We need to also bring to the table the BIPOC communities to share decision making. Local communities must influence priorities and offer meaningful uh, oversight as well. And very, very important, and I would like to really to end with this. The reforms should be intersectoral, acknowledging the great diversity among our communities which, when inter interwined, can deepen the inequities in our societies. So the more diverse we are as a group of health professionals, but even beyond the health professionals, the better decisions we want to come, come up. So this is the challenge. I think that we come from, from, from a society uh, in higher education that we were striking a lot many, many decades ago for equality. And then we went to, no, we want equity and equity we all feel like we need to give everybody the opportunities that that everyone in particular need but really the, the the goal is to go to justice because justice is actually eliminating the barriers that's the hardest right we are right now more like in the equ equity and we feel good about that giving the people you know what they need in order to succeed in our higher education and giving you know access to everyone but we need to think about what are the barriers that really is they are you know they are they are they are impeding that people really thrive and communities and we all as health professionals need to go and look beyond and, and work and do something in terms to eliminate the barriers in order to reach really uh, justice. So I want to just to end with this quote uh, uh, and and really just just saying that uh, specifically. I think in higher education, but especially I think in the health professions, we need to champion this effort. I really do. And we need to model how is to live in an anti-racism environment and achieving health equity. So if not now, when? If not us, who? So thank you. And I'm looking forward for a conversation with all of you. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Magana. A great <clears throat> presentation. Uh, great seeing you here. Uh, certainly, your leadership of ASPPH has been a critical turning point in many of these conversations. Uh, I, I always look at, you know, as we try to achieve certain. I'm Boris Lushniak. I'm the dean of the School of Public Health at University of Maryland in College Park. Um, when we look at what we're trying to achieve here, and and you know, you denoted well, sort of the the whys and the the. the the big stumbling block is the hows. And to some extent, it's one thing sort of putting out the list saying, here's what we should do. But it's also sort of an acknowledgement of what are the barriers of, of getting there. And I really just want to go back to sort of the basics. And we all speak about this, right? The difference between healthcare and, and true health in our society. And, and in essence, I think the numbers may be up to 11,000 plus that we spend on health care in our country. And then we talk about the investments of those 11,000 on prevention or on public health, and it ends up being $3 per person from the 11,000. And oftentimes, one of the things we're up against is a major industry, right? A min industry that flourishes. It is the health care industry, whether it's the pharmaceuticals, whether it's, in fact, the caregivers, right, the business side of, of medical care. How is it, from your perspective, that we, we battle such an incredible monstrosity? Because, you know, there is a tug of war going on. And, and it's people like us sitting in a room talking about, well, well, look, at look, this is about <laughs> equity and this is about justice. And, and then we go back into our existence and there is an, you know, seemingly an immovable force out there. Any recommendations from your experience? 
Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dean. Well, first of all, I think that that's why we're in, in higher education. And I love higher education. I have spent all my life in higher education. And what I love about higher education is that we are educating the next generation. So sometimes there's things that we see right now in our environment, our politicians, and the way things are that we don't like it. And, and we say it needs to change. And of course, we do a lot of advocacy. We do a lot of, and I, you know, strong believer that with advocacy, we can change some things. But it's really the, I mean, I, I think that the significant change is gonna come from our students. It's not gonna come from our generation. Our generation is, we might, influence something and hopefully we, we, we can do something. But it's through education, it's through our next generation. So we are, that's why our responsibility is so huge because we are having here educating the people who are really gonna be doing a change in our world. So how, are, how they see all these things matters and is so important because they are gonna be the leaders of the future. So what I'm thinking is the more we ensure that all these principles are embedded in our students, then we can you know, we'll be sure that at least the near future is gonna be better than the, the future that we are living right now. And of course, right now, the only thing that we can do as, as higher education is continuing our advocacy uh, you know, activity with the current moment nationally and globally and hope. The other, uh, aside from, uh, from, from advocacy, is really working with our partners. That's why it's such an important part of what we do in higher education is just to have our local, our part, national and global partners in order to move the needle. Because it's, it's, not, it's not just a one person, it's just a one organization, one association or one field as a job. It, it's really about all of us and we are all adding something to the big spectrum. So I think, I would say those things, is just continue really training at the best as we can, the competencies in our students, being more interprofessional, uh, really seriously interprofessional in really, one of the things that we can do as, and, and that's what I, I like that here is representing the whole system. That makes it, you can do the transformation because it's the system. Sometimes when we are in our program, in our school, it's very hard to really break the silos. But if it's really uh, a commitment from the whole system, you can, by system, you know, uh, construct the curriculum and the opportunities for the students to interact uh, and in order to make all of this happen. And, and just the faculty, just being here faculty from around the system, it's already an opportunity to talk about what can we do to, to, to provide these opportunities for the faculty, for the students, for the, for the, for the community. So that's what I would say. Thank you. I, uh, I really appreciate it and something that hit me from your slides, and I'll stand a little back and take this off, um, was the removal of faculty, staff, and students who are problematic in terms of racist behavior. And, and, one of, and I love having like heavy hitters from every campus, but what I'll say, I, I spent almost eight years as a department chair, and you know the adage that 20% of your faculty create 80% of your problems. The issue that I experienced, and also I'm doing some DEI research, um, uh, qualitative research looking at student perspectives, um, uh, BIPOC students from other programs, and that is that the people you have on board with your diversity and equity training, they're the ones that are engaged, they're the ones that are coming to the training, they're the, they're the ones that are sort of in your court. And the problem, one of the barriers, one of the frustrations is, you know, you'll have these diversity seminars and your problematic faculty sit in the back and check their email. Or you take them to task and say, you know, a black student came into my office and complained about this, and the faculty members, well, I don't see the problem. I'm like, well, here's the problem, and here's how we need to solve it. No, I don't agree with you. And then there are the, well, they're discriminating against the white people now. They are, um, that's actually came out of the mouth of one of my faculty when I was a chair. Or um, we really do need to think about white men becoming a minority and being discriminated against. And so these things are actual things that came out of faculty members' mouths. And so my frustration was that you have people who are on board and who are really interested in moving forward these initiatives, and then you're fighting against the systems that, that protect faculty who refuse to change mindset and are are creating systems of microaggression towards students. And it's not just Towson, it's, it's the whole system, it's the whole country. And so I'd love to hear your perspective on how, I mean, to the extent where I don't know we could, that we can remove individuals 
um, from those positions, but how can we move the needle forward? Because the backlash when you even stand up and say this is not okay, you know, that you get, the, the toxic environment that is created, the, the, the outright, you know, attacks when you hold people to task are very difficult for your middle managers, your chair people, um, your directors to try and deal with when the students are coming to you and saying the faculty is doing this, and, and no matter what you do, it's, you can't move the needle. So I would love to hear some perspectives on what you've done to be successful for that 20% that are causing, in my perspective, 80% of the problems. Yeah, thank you, thank you for that question. And, and that's tough, that's a, that's a tough one. I wanna share something that, uh, you know, I believe in, in higher education, uh, we, we can do. And, and working with faculty, you always need to know that in the faculty we always have if, if, if we say, uh, it doesn't matter the issue, but in, the, in 100%, you always have, you know, like let's 10 or 15% of your faculty that they will do the right things no matter what, with you, without you, with the policy, without the policy, but they're great, right? You're always gonna have the same 15, 20% of, of faculty that no matter what you do or who is there, they would never follow, you know. And then you have this here, right? Like 60% of your faculty, I will tell you, concentrate on those. We need to concentrate on the 60% of the faculty that need a little bit more training, push, in order to really gain all of that. So I think that sometimes most of our energy will go to this 15%, but if we really create you know, an environment for those, the, the rest of the people, they will at least, most of your students, at least most of your faculty or the culture is gonna be Two are the things that you that that you want to do, and I always uh, sometimes I, I, I use uh, the example of I said, if Jesus changed this world with twelve people, I mean you're gonna change it if you have like ten faculty with you because eventually those ten, fifteen, or twenty faculty members will embed it more and more, and then this, the students, the students is a great they're a great power because once they started to see the changes or the you know the values in these group of faculty, of leaders of the university, they are going to be the ones who's going to be pushing this other faculty, right, uh, that they don't want to be part of it. So I would say just, we need to just keep on going. And we need to just keep on going and trying to have our motivations from the ones that really want the change and just always focusing on the students because they are the ones who are really, you know, thirsty for, for us to stand up for this issue. So they are our motivation. So that's what I would say. <laughs> Hi, <clears throat> Londata Jones from the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Thank you for an amazing talk. Um, and uh, actually the Dean here took my question, but <laughs> building upon that, I recognize that, like you said, it's really, you know, the next generation, the persons that we're gonna train to take our positions to do so much better than we've done. And so I was wondering in terms of, you mentioned higher education is key. And just recently at UNB, we have experienced a wonderful ceremony of Cure Scholars that have graduated that we reached back into the middle school level. And this was focused on, you know, helping their trajectory in West Baltimore of underserved um, students. And several of my colleagues here are uh, supporting that as well as Chancellor Perman, who actually was huge in moving that forward. But giving that example, um, I was wondering how far do you feel we need to reach back to, so we're here at higher education, but a lot of these behaviors, the anti-racism, et cetera, are ingrained like far. And so I was wondering your perspective on you know, maybe it's a situation like this where we're, you know, not only the higher education, but high school and middle school. So what would that look like to try to reach back early on? Thank you for your question, and you're exactly right. Actually, we need to start K-12. We really need to start in the kindergarten, the primary, in order to really embed these values in, into the students. And we need to start in the family. Really? So I think if we start, if we could have like 
the system, the power, just to really bring everybody together in terms of education and then start with K all the way to the university. Of course, that's, that's the best bet because the kids, when they are in primary school, that's where they really are you know, bringing uh, all the values in and growing and really embedded in, in a society where more, 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 more equal and more just. And, and if you want kids, if you are grown outs, grown ups, uh, just to be, you know, with embracing, embracing all these values, you need to start with, of course, with, with, with the kids. Now, I think that because all the previous system are not maybe doing that job, then it's, it's, it's our turn. And maybe it's hard, it's harder because you, you know they are not exposed before to that. But then we are the last chance that they have in a system in order to really go out in society or in the workplace in order to do that. that so that's why it's so important that we do our job, assuming that hopefully you know, we, we, we really can impact them in order for them to, to go into society. But hopefully in the future, yeah, definitely uh, you're right. It had, this has to be embedded uh, all the way from primary school you know, higher education and community colleges and uh, until a university, yes. Thank you for that question. Sorry, a little short here. Good morning, man. Hoi Antron, Professor at University of Maine Eastern Shore. Thank you for a great talk. I have a um, question about how you felt about accreditation. Uh, there's a cliche to say that uh, voluntary is best one is mandatory. <laughs> And I felt that as a professor who have taken student on rotation, create opportunity, is only for the some student. You know, my passion, some of the students' passion, some of those faculty colleagues who are here. But we should be talking about for all students, not for some students. Should not be an elective, but perhaps one, perhaps one way to do it through accreditation. So I'm just wondering, as a macro level of all the association of schools and program of public health and all the other health profession, how do you felt about and how soon, how quick should we have? accreditation to make this happen because I felt that like we're moving slow, not moving needle unless we have accreditation mandate. Thank you so much. Extremely, extremely important. Uh, so just to share, uh, th those your accreditation bodies should be on the table when you're talking about this. Uh, at ASPPH, when we start talking about, about this, like two or three years ago, uh, CIF, which is our accreditation body, they were at the table with us all the way in, 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 in this uh, document that, that, that you saw, you know, just to see what we are thinking about it. When we finished the document um, very recently, actually CIF, which is our creators, they call us, and that was a couple of months ago, uh, and say, we really want to do something to support this change because we, we also are aware and we want to put some teeth in, in, into that. So we actually uh, presented the framework to them and they are very seriously now considering that in the next revision of the of the criteria and of the competencies, they will put something of the, the things that we said in the in the in the in the framework. I think that's extremely extremely important because then. But remember, accreditation is just the floor. I have always seen that accreditation is a floor. So at least they have something there that 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 all our institutions have to really comply in order to be accredited, and and then. More than that, it's more to our institutions to even go beyond what our accreditation uh, is asking. But accreditation is the floor and we have to really do that. So thank you for the, for the question. Good morning, thank you so much for sharing your, uh, sharing your views, it's really helpful. My name is David Bennell. I'm from Frostburg State uh, Department of PA Medicine. I want to comment to my uh, my uh, colleague in the Eastern Shore. Uh, in the PA world, it is actually part of our accreditation as our new standards, uh, as it ties a program into how the the university supports them. So that conversation is happening in some places. Uh, so I'm really glad I could uh, follow my colleague. But my question to you is that I see that through your experience, you have a very global and international perspective. And, and I find that anytime I think that I'm in a hole alone and I'm only having that problem, is that as it turns out, somebody else has thought about it and I just didn't find the right community. Mm -hmm. So my question is to what are, from Frostburg where we serve rural and medically underserved populations, what lessons learned in public health are the same and what are very, very different based on context? Thank you for the question. And yeah, well, first of all, I think our, our biggest challenges 
are really global. When we, th when we think about, uh, of course, this health equity around the world, climate change around the world, when we think about some of the main really uh, challenges that we face, they are global. Now, having said that, they are global, but they have, lo they have very l focus or local focus. And we need to do, to do that uh, because it's not the same as, you know, health equity, how you, in, for example, in the urban environment, how we, you know, face it, how we live it, as in the rural, with migrants, for example, with communities of color, with communities of black people. So it's very different, and I think we need to learn that. That's part of our literacy, lit, um, our literacy in terms of being really, you know, anti-racism is just being aware that there are really difference in terms of diversity, and we should go and listen first and just be part of understanding that culture on that environment in order to really implement things. So, uh, I'm, and you're right, I'm, I'm, I'm very global in, in, in my experiences, but I'm very aware that if something I have learned during all these years in terms of uh, being living outside in very different countries is just the importance of being very local to the needs of the people in that particular community, in that particular environment. So you always need to, to arrive and just be, just learn, learn how, what the community, so that's why it's very important to bring the community in the, the discussions, to bring the diversity at the discussions and not be just like the outsider, uh, you know, bringing, so, so bringing, the, but the, the opposite is true too. Nothing is so local that cannot you can't learn like from a global perspective because there's always a global perspective. There's always somebody else doing something that you can learn. And we don't, I mean, we're not here just to invent the wheel, right? We need to really learn what's already going on. And in this topic, there's already a lot going on in the, in the world. So we just need to learn a little bit more and just try to see what, what is best for our system. What is what, so that's why I, I really like that. How do you structure the, the workshop? Because it's about what do you think? Because you are the ones who are here with students, with the community. So it's more about you. Uh, in terms of what are the things that are really resonates with the system that could make, you know, the best uh, alternatives for, for the system for the students here. So thank you. <laughs>